outside. Cool. Yeah, and you can leave your questions also here if uh, yeah. or whatever works. To be honest with you, thank you, Ayush. I don't know. Am I a founder? Yes, yes. I can send you my company name as well. Cool. Sure. Let's hit one fifty, and then oh, we have hit one fifty. Yeah, I mean, Twitter handle. What is my Twitter handle? I think it is. So, what does my startup do? We do insurance. Yes. but some very wacky insurance if you if you read anything about us online right now it'll be very different from what uh, people will see in two or three months i won't talk too much about that yeah. but yeah dude i'm good good to start whenever you are right It's great uh, quite a few people man yeah i think you can get started what is big four like big four sounds like the consulting firms which you should not should not work at Cool, Rahul. So uh, I'll start off with a quick introduction, and then probably cool. we can move towards the session. Uh, hey, guys! Thanks a lot for joining in. Um, I can see quite a lot of enthusiastic folks joining, and we have around one eighty right now. Uh, quick intro about Rahul. He's the founder of Bima Pay. Uh, for now, uh, Bima Pay is you know this platform which helps you understand your hidden insurance benefits. So if you guys are curious about your insurance, just go to Bima Pay's website, check out what insurance plans you have, and you'll get more clarity about it. Uh, Rahul has a master's from the University of Warwick. He's also a LinkedIn and Twitter influencer. I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys might have come across his content. He writes a lot about startups and how he has been building Bima Pay. Um, he builds in public, and it's been really inspiring to see his journey from zero to one and further. Uh, it you know it'll really help you get a sneak peek into what goes behind building a startup. And I've personally learned a lot throughout his journey. Um, He's also an angel investor in Blue Loan, so super happy to have him on board. Uh, let's move back to the session. Uh, today we'll be talking about the rise of Gen Z founders, right? Rahul himself is someone who started out pretty early, and he'll be sharing his experiences of Bima Pay. He'll also be, you know, giving you guys some examples about how he went about building this company, and maybe we can also talk about, you know, other young companies like Fampay and Oyo, which also have super young founders. And at the end of the session, we'll have a quick Q and A. So, in case you guys have any questions, leave them in the chat section, and we'll take the good ones. So, with that said, thanks for coming, Rahul, and looking forward to an amazing session. Likewise, lovely to meet everyone. I think I'm getting super distracted by looking at the feed of comments, but let's get started. So, do you want me to like talk a little bit about the journey? Are there specific questions? How do you want to go about this one? Probably, you can start. talking about how you know lack of i mean when you start off there was a lack of experience yeah. but then how you sort of built out that knowledge base and made it more structured in a way yeah look i think anything which i tell you right the first days of company building are totally chaotic so i had no idea what was going on we had abraz our designer ishan and kunal as our two founding engineers i was also trying to write some code it was complete chaos it was chaos for the first four months even harish and anyone who's run a company will tell you that's true but i think where the idea of starting to build our product came in is very natural because insurance is something which quite a few people in india have tons of more people don't have it but in my case it stemmed from a personal observation that in the first wave of covid almost all of my friends who were reasonably well educated were coming running to me and saying rahul can you help me and my dad or me and my mom understand what insurance we have because we need to make a claim because some family member is in hospital right now and the agent is also in hospital so that was the moment of chaos where no one knew where they had their insurance and that's what made me start to think right this is a problem which i knew because in 2016 2017 2018 2018 three years when i was in university i had to help my mom file a couple of insurance claims because of my grandparents ending up in hospital and it was do completely chaotic right i didn't know whether we should file this on my mom's corporate health insurance my mom's health insurance my grandparents health insurance and we even couldn't find the documents so for me i didn't actually test multiple ideas which i also think is one of the questions there right i'm sure most of you have like five to six really good ideas for me it was just 
I've faced this problem before. I can see quite a few people now in the middle of COVID are resonating with the problem. Let me now see whether this is actually a quote unquote venture scale business. So if you're not like a startup nerd, this is going to sound really irritating, but the number one way to figure out whether your business is actually a business is not to go out and start building, but is to go out and start testing. So the, the framework which I use, which there's a very good uh, author by the name of Marty Kagan, M-A-R-T-Y-C-A-G-N. And he has a book called Inspired, which if any of you want to become a product manager is absolute gold standard. And Marty has this really nice four-step risk framework where he says the four risks you want to kind of remove from your business is feasibility, which is, can you build what you're saying? Sorry, there's just a bit of work going on in the office with wiring. I'll just move around. But the risks are feasibility, usability, business model viability, and I can't remember the fourth one. But for me, the biggest risk on feasibility is, would people be willing to share their personal data with us? Otherwise, everything we build on the machine learning front, the recommendation front, the analysis front, just falls flat on its face. And that is what I tell you, right? When you have that idea, think about what could kill your idea. What if something goes wrong would end up being the death of your company? And for me, it was 100% people not being willing to share their personal data and not enough people caring about the problem. So I actually did five by five by five, which is 125 customer interviews over a five week period all alone. I don't recommend you doing this, but at the end of every customer interview, I did two things, right? I asked them, I asked them, would you be willing to share your family's insurance policy documents with me? And would you be, you know, would you be willing to, I don't remember how I phrased this question, would you be willing to pay for this kind of a product? And that's really how it started, right? Where I saw people had the willingness to pay, people were beginning, willing to share their data, which in India is seemingly the easy problem, but people doing it willingly really shows that there is some semblance of problem value fit, right? The problem you're looking to solve is valuable to customers. And that's honestly how you get started, right? Because a lot of you, including I at that point, had an idea but you can't build a company on an idea. You tend to build a company on an insight or a collection of insights. And that gap between idea and insight is the hypothesis testing that you do, right? Which is, does this problem resonate with more than just me? Is this really a problem worth solving? And then what solution do I build for this problem? So you go from idea to insight. And then you start building the company on whatever insights you have. Now, granted, yeah, I'm Gen Z, super young, I'm 23. But there was still an element of having been someone who's worked in insurance before. So I did have product insights from past work experience, which is also something that helped me. But look, the, the early days of company building is all about you going out there, talking to your customers, trying to figure out what they really want. And then from there, go about building a company, right? So it's, you start from idea, you then go to a collection of insights. From an insight, you build some product which uses those insights. And then from product, you go to company. So that was honestly our journey, right? In a nutshell, we went out there, talked to hundreds of users in the first four months, even with our designer and our engineers. And then started building from there, right? It took us, I think, 60 days to ship our first quote unquote product. But that first quote unquote product was on the back of maybe 150 to 200 customer conversations, which is what you should be doing. Because the one lesson which I have learned and everyone on my team will tell you this is it is super easy to build a product today, right? There are quite a lot of React developers out there. There are quite a lot of designers. There are enough product people. The hardest part, dude, is figuring out what you should build and why you should build it. And that's where we sucked so badly for the first two and a half, 
three, even four months, but ended up getting our things together after going through Y Combinator. So Y Combinator was like a shotgun to us and we suddenly realized, holy shit, we're doing all the wrong stuff over here. So it was good. I'm going to pause there. That was like month one, two, three, four in a nutshell. Is there something you want me to go into the Y Combinator experience or something? Sure. I think that will be amazing. Uh, maybe, you know, why do you apply to Y Combinator in the first place? How was the application process? How was the interview? And then how YC helped you to reach where cool. you are right now? Okay. Okay. So I think YC was definitely an inflection point for us, not on growth, not on revenue. That's completely unrelated. But it definitely was an inflection point for us in terms of company maturity and thinking. So if you looked at us before YC, you would have properly said, these are a bunch of idiots who have no idea what they're doing. Like God knows how they've raised any money. At least what I picked up at YC and the same with all of the people in my company whom I shared all the literature with is we became quite heavy on process orientation, right? So earlier, every time we faced a problem, we just did troubleshooting without any process. Earlier, when a customer came to us with a piece of feedback, we'd quickly go and make the fix. But we suddenly moved from this ad hoc company to a company that had a product roadmap to a company that had an engineering cadence, which is the pace at which you're shipping, right? Is it weekly? Is it fortnightly? Is it monthly? We also became a little bit more disciplined on our metrics, right? So what is our North Star metric, which is that single number against which we're all working towards? And then what are the paired metrics with the North Star metric, right? So if you're tracking only revenue, are you also tracking average revenue per user? So no one games the system. Are you tracking something called net promoter score, which is even though people are buying from you, are they happy after buying from you? Or are you just shoving products down their throat, which is important in insurance. So that's the value that YC brought to us. We had obviously raised money before getting into YC itself. But I'll take one step back and talk to you about the YC application process. So if any of you are looking to apply to Y Combinator, the first thing to do is to not reach out to anyone saying, please help me understand what questions they ask. Go to the Google search bar and type YC supernova question set. There are roughly, I think 62 odd questions in there, which is everything you will need both for the YC application and for the YC interview. It's not just I who swears by it. I got introduced to the question set by Shashank and Harshil from Razorpay. These guys have been in there for many, many more years than I am. So that question set was super helpful. Honestly, our motivation behind going to YC was quite frankly that we hadn't gone through this uh, incubation period as a company, right? We had just incorporated, raised money. There were six of us and we were suddenly like, None of us have really shipped a large product before. It's going to be the first time we're doing this. We needed a bit of like hands-on operational support. And that is what the appeal of YC was. Did it give that hands-on operational support? No, not really. But it gave us the playbook to go and figure things out ourselves. So I, there's actually a fun story behind how we applied to YC. Uh, I submitted the application with minutes to go before the deadline, but I had spent a ton of time on the application, about two weeks with maybe an hour every day, so 10 to 15 hours. I got the interview questions reviewed by some other founders who've been through YC. That's one thing I'd advise you to do if you have time to do it. When we got the YC interview, I was shocked and I was like, whoa, that's the worst piece of shit document I've ever submitted in my life. I don't know how someone even read it. But the fun fact here for any of you wondering, the Y Combinator interviewers actually read your application because they did clarify three items in maybe a two-page document. So pick your words carefully. They are reading stuff. Ultimately, the YC interview was super short. So I had mine for seven minutes. It turns out our partner at YC, Tim Brady understands insurance because he had made two insurance investments through Y Combinator before. And I fell asleep 
when you're actually supposed to stay awake and wait for them to call you back and give you a result. So I didn't know we got into Y Combinator until the next day at about 7, 8 a.m. in the morning when I got the email from them saying you haven't responded to us. But anyways, just call us back whenever you have some time. So that was super surprising, but that was a YC journey for us. It is definitely worth the 7% on your company. I would sort of swear by it. It's super good. Awesome. Uh, maybe I can take some questions from the chat. I uh, did enable it and made it hosts only because someone was spamming a link. No. Um, okay. So one of the questions is that insurance is a very regulated industry yeah. and uh, it's super hard for like new players to get in, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. in India where, you know, trust is a yeah. super important factor. So mm -hmm. how do you go about that? Like it's a very hard space to be in. So what was the urge to get into the industry and then how do you navigate through such a complex industry? Yeah. So I think I'll, I'll take the easy part of the question, right? Which is how, how or why did you pick insurance? Like, I'm a qualified actually, man. I've been in insurance for three years. I get it. I've done the subject matter at, at university itself. So for me, this was very easy to understand. I've never struggled with any of the insurance concepts. Why did I pick insurance despite it being so complex? There's a personal story for me, right? I'd say about 10 to 12 years ago, it was it's always when my mom, her grandparents and I were a small family. We were not doing as well financially then as now, but my mom ended up in hospital with a health condition called septicemia. Dude, those bills from septicemia can cripple any any family financially even today. We got super lucky. We had a super top up. I won't confuse you with the technical stuff back then. Really saved us financially. Otherwise, we'd probably have to sell all assets except for the house just to pay those bills. So I've always thought, right? There's a pretty large part of India which does not have insurance. We got lucky that my grandfather had the foresight to buy a proper insurance plan. I don't know what the rest of the country is doing. So I've always thought, is there a sorry, is there a way to make this process easier, more engaging, more product driven versus call center driven? And that was the hypothesis which we went in with. So yeah, but good question. And about the regulation part, uh, yeah. was it tough for you? Uh, fortunately not, right? Again, uh, a lot of the regulation is fairly standard in insurance across many geographies. So it was just a matter of us applying for the license and in which case in most fintech companies, you would find external consultants who are very well placed to help you with the licensing application process. In fact, there are some people who do this for a living, right? If mm -hmm. you want to get a payments license, you'll find some guy on the market who'll be able to help you. And same with insurance, right? There are enough ex-public sector employees who are happy to consult you on these matters and even help you get the license for a success fee. Got it. Another question is, how do you look at dilution in a startup? Uh, because hmm. as, it, as it moves on, you have to give equity to investors, employees. Yeah. So yeah. what's the, you know, structure that you follow okay so the the general rule of thumb which i like to follow is i do not want to dilute more than 20 percent on each round if you want you can try this in excel and just see if 20 percent of the company keeps getting diluted after like five rounds you'll be down to maybe reasonable double digits and if you have multiple co-founders like forget it you're straight down to single digits after five rounds so the the, the approach which I take to dilution is I don't want largest amount of money at highest price because at some point you have to come back and justify the valuation, right? If you're not growing fast enough, not generating enough revenue, that high valuation will come to bite you really badly. And the honest truth for whoever asked that question, I presume you're starting an early stage company in India, like no offense, you do not have pricing power and you do not have control over how much money people are going to give you. Your price at a pre-seed and your amount of capital given at a pre-seed is very, very much dictated by whom your investors are. So a very vanilla thing is to give an, a pre-seed company somewhere between 
250k to 500k for 20 to 22 percent of the company which is what most startups end up doing and then from there out honestly dude it's super dependent on your business and how fast you're growing so if you're growing like 30 percent month on month organic generating revenue your next round could be 5 million on 20 on a 20 million post money valuation which means you dilute about 25 percent of the company or you may do 1.5 million on 15 million post money valuation which is 10 percent of the company but yeah dude in in a lot of cases dilution is just not within your control you just want to make sure that you try to keep it to under 20 percent on each round it's is very dependent see look and and harish a lot of people in in colleges right now are doing electric vehicle startups i have no idea how much you have to dilute to get started because that's a hardware business you need to raise ton more money very different from software businesses which you and i run in software just take what you're getting at a fair price and continue man true true um and also uh, you know you right after college you start building your team and i see a lot of people struggling with building the team finding the right kind of people like yeah. a common question is hey i don't know how to code i have an idea uh, mm. i need someone to code it out for me and he he, yeah. he has to become my tech co-founder so mm. um and as we move on hiring tech talent is also becoming a hassle mm-hmm. because yeah. every startup is getting funded and then yeah. there's a lack of good engineers so how do you go about this particular issue because yeah. there are other really huge venture funded startups which you know pay probably 2x the amount you yeah. or me would pay uh, so how do you navigate through that issue oh yeah, yeah i think two also is a little low right if you look at the thrasio and the mensas of the world they're paying 5x industry average in india but Ultimately, there's obviously first an element of luck, right? One of our best backend engineers honestly came in via Twitter referral and our founding designer Abraz again came in via referral. We were looking for a designer, but he just happened to be the right person who was open to working with us, who enjoyed his first conversation and joined us. So you have to rely on a little bit of serendipity. So I got lucky there that that backend hire whom we would have gotten at some point because we've now got people, we managed to get super early. And the same with the designer, right? Getting designers actually, Harish, is just as hard as getting engineers right now because everyone's hiring designers. So when you go about structuring the early team, and I think you can see this more in Harish's company with Shreyansh and the rest with Blue Learn rather than us, is anyone who tells you do not try to hire friends or people you know just take your middle finger and show both of them to those people they have never run a company they cannot run a company they're not qualified to run a company it is very very normal for any person starting up as long as they have raised some amount of venture money to hire friends ex co-workers or ex colleagues in whatever form to come join them Quite simply, because your most precious resources in early stage startup is not money. It's actually damn time. And the moment you're with a bunch of people whom you know well, you can take short corners on communication, on documentation, and on process because you've worked with each other for so long. You can turbocharge your company. First couple of months, actually, at our end, we didn't do too much documentation just because we knew how the other person worked, obviously went back and fixed those errors. It didn't cost us a lot, but that speed is super important. And don't underestimate that. Right? So don't fall for this, uh, you know, don't do a business with your friends. Don't hire anyone whom you know, like all bullshit. Right? You go there and look at even Razorpay's founding team. Half of those people were in college with Harshil and Shashank. And it's the same at many other very fast growing companies. Even Grow has a very large number of ex Flipkart colleagues of the Grow founders. So devil is in the detail. Of course, there are some people who want to tweet uh, like Mark Andreessen, ignore them. They don't know what they're saying. So that's how I'd approach it. And honestly, if you don't have money in the early days to pay someone, don't worry too much because If you are at that stage, you're either not generating revenue or you've not raised your first amount of money, 
which means you're probably still sitting at the idea stage and not at the product stage and you can get from the idea to the product stage without writing any code like i didn't write any code i honestly didn't for the first two months of me doing the user research and only then started writing very minimal code when i realized this is something worth investing into so try to find what the best low code or no code tool is because it seems if these companies are raising like 75 million there's probably like at least 100000 people using it on the on the unpaid version so it's obviously decently good i have not used any of these but i do remember for prototyping since i'm not very well versed with html css react and the front end languages i used a product called glide.app and it's beautiful i'd honestly tell you in some cases it's better than having a front end engineer and designer glide is so good for testing ideas it's the one where you attach a google sheet and yep. make an app yep. out of it yeah yeah i've built few things on it yeah it's good it's good it's good <laughs> Um okay let's see what else do we have um hmm. people are asking questions about as you said before right talk to customers even before you you know start yeah. building a product out but then it's very important to ask the right kind of questions yeah. uh so what kind of questions should a potential yeah. customer be asked yeah i think the 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 the, the number one the number one issue with uh, with questions people tend to ask is you're either framing your question in a way where the response is yes no or you're framing your question in a way which is to bias the the response so l- let's try this thought experiment harish lightspeed is a great investor to work with right for sure yeah like no shit because i i, I literally yeah. told you right and i was like great investor whereas i should have actually asked harish can you tell me a little bit about your experience working with lightspeed it's fine to have the question being completely open ended it's fine to look like an idiot because yeah. trust me your parents still think you're damn smart don't care about anyone else it's fine to sound like an idiot in a customer call and ask them questions that the customer is thinking group like this guy is never going to run a company that's fine like i still begin some of our customer interviews even right now by asking questions which make my own team members get scared they're like dude have you suffered from amnesia because you keep asking this but it's important right so it's fine asking open ended questions you don't want to ask uh, leading questions right so a leading question is where you are soliciting a particular answer because the answer forms part of your question so just some generic guidance there and look if you're like really serious about all of this i don't recommend this you can check out a book called running lean i don't remember the author's name right now but that's great right it's a great guide book you know you can actually sit down there with pen and paper and work through it i used that for one of the startup ideas i was working on a while back but i'd recommend running lean if you want to figure out how to ask good questions in a customer interview fair i think even google venture has something called the design sprint, sprint right yeah. sprint questions yeah those yeah. are pretty good yeah so the the other book there is actually sprint by the same google design yeah. uh, and ventures team which is also just as good yeah they do like a mock interview of a customer that's pretty good yeah yeah someone has asked a very complex insurance questions or something okay I'm not sure if you should take it up maybe you can reach out to rahul directly okay um okay oh another question is why don't you have a co-founder oh damn good question dude i just uh, just figured i'd start building man trust me the so i'll i shouldn't say this because harish has co-founders you can go into the into the data and you can find out the primary reason why most companies end up dying and i can assure you it's not running out of money there's another reason but keeping that aside i personally have this very bad and very good habit of just wanting to move super fast right so if i have an idea even if it's like 10 o'clock in the night i'll be like screw you i'm going to go write something about this think about this do something about this and that's probably why right it didn't even strike me until i went to my first investor call and they're like oh it's just you and i was like yeah it's just me sorry i completely forgot about that but it's cool 
like solo founder co founder co founders founding team and all like dude ultimately it does not make business any easier business is still damn hard right even if you're eight people co founding a company you still need to generate revenue so someone needs to pick up the burden and chances are you're the one thinking of the idea right now you would probably pick up bulk of the burden unless the idea has come about with two or three of you sitting together it you may find it hard to get that kind of buy in fair fair another question is um how do you raise your first round with just an idea yeah so so we were definitely not idea when we raised the first round right because i had pretty strong conviction in it so we already four people designer front end back end engineer and i so we already had a team that could ship a product we had already shipped a product in alpha which allowed the investors to go in and dabble around but more importantly we also had something called a product vision in figma so the product vision was like a nice interactive prototype which showed the investors what this product would look like 6 to 8 months down the line in addition to that i also said if you're really that crazy you can come and check all of our user research logs so there's there was a lot more to the company than just the idea we had gone tested it we had shipped something in in B, in alpha and we also had a team so yeah i didn't i didn't pull off a jupiter bank over here where i said neo bank and got 30 million that's uh, that's next level and not recommended for children and uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on the product vision like how did that document look like okay so it's not a document right figma is a prototype oh, you tool, made a figma. design okay. tool yeah so or you could do pro- you actually you need to start a product vision in writing because you need to elaborate on what you want the user to achieve therefore what features are required and etc etc so you need a document but the idea behind that product vision was as a team because we were building a product for which we couldn't find a suitable global or even local example we had to go completely from first principles so the idea of product vision was we looked out a year and a half or two years and said what could this one hub for your family's insurance look like as a mobile application and that's how we ended up designing it right so we created a design over three or four days took that over a week two weeks of user testing bit of usability research as well and then said this is our product vision have we stuck to it yeah i think the product vision has been super helpful to maintain that north star obviously the ground level details in terms of the layout the color scheme the copy the interaction is vastly different but it's still that you know bigger picture of where we want to be now like 6 months down the line got it and another question is why did you invest in blue learn oh damn good question uh let me think let me think let me think why did i invest in them yeah dude i mean you've spoken to hari said they seem like a bunch of smart people and the other reason why i decided to invest in this is one of the one of the gaps which i see in terms of the whole remote education and edtech space right now is education has different jobs to be done right it's a bundle of several different services for each one of you so for me education was partially status right i want to stick that uh, Uh, that M Tech, B Tech, whatever C Tech degree which you have, stick it on the wall and tell everyone in my family, "Mari pas a degree che," right? As I would say in Gujarati. But along with the status, right, there is also the element of finding a job, which I think everyone from upgrade to my pop is trying to build today. The next element after the status, the job. comes like the technical skills again i think there are enough boot camps and all the other shit there but the one thing which a lot of people forget about education is that campus life that dorm life that internet life in my case like screw it there was no campus life no dorm life it was anyways internet life and i had seen how 350 people in my cohort at warwick were actually closer because of the internet life rather than the dorm life or, or college life 
anyways none of those assholes ever showed up for a lecture i was probably one of the 40 people to show up there from 400 the other thing is i really doubt people went to visit each other across dorms because you had to walk like 2 kilometers one way with no bus so i had seen how powerful the internet is to service that need of oh we are part of one cohort we learn together we learn from each other and that's what i think blue learn could end up addressing right i don't know whether other companies in the space i don't even care because it's they like what and uh, you've done the market sizing like harish there what 10 million kids going into college every at the start of every year the minimum yeah around 25 yeah yeah so 25 is huge right so it's big right and i think people may get value out of it mm-hmm. and the most important thing is bulk of india actually end, ends up going to colleges where you lack access to these kind of Correct. interactions you lack access maybe these kind of friends because if you're a really smart person who is trying to learn how to code trying to learn how to design sitting in a commerce college somewhere where most of your peers are trying to get into the accounting profession yeah dude you probably want a change of community to to actually get you in into a into a job maybe part of some network which will get you a job so that's what i thought it would meet and let's see right it's only an angel investment it's not yeah a public market investment the customers would tell at the end the yeah. users would tell at the end yeah but yeah i mean it's correct we're solving for the community aspect of it cuz there was too much of content but mm-hmm. this was the yeah. uh, thing that was lacking um i'm not sure if we should take these but these these are in short tech questions maybe for like 2 3 minutes um okay i'll scroll down as well Okay, insurance inherently has four components: insurance, claim, servicing, regulatory overhead, and distribution. Any thoughts on innovating downstream distribution beyond insurance, like handling claims as you scale? Yeah, uh, we probably could do this. It's just that uh, it is just uh, is just impossible to to do claims when we are an insurance broker because uh, lo and behold, regulation has a different class of company which does. claims handling call a third party claims administrator but great question if you get in touch with me in 3 months you'll realize there's a small change in our business good question but yes claims is one thing to solve for is very hard to solve for in the current regulatory structure okay the same person has asked another follow up question not a follow up question but a separate question legal and regulatory commitments change and are varying in regions how do you think insurtech can typically cover potentially large losses I'd love to know if you have any thoughts. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure because the advantage of doing fintech is in India is you have only single regulators for different uh, for the entire country across different verticals versus the USA where you have to go state by state regulation so there's no difference. Uh large losses I mean large losses are mainly absorbed by the government right they are the insurer of the insurance companies i won't bore you too much with that but but yeah dude like everything from an earthquake to a wildfire to flooding is primarily picked up by the government which fyi gets cut from your uh, you know year end uh, salary via taxes so you are actually paying for it yeah um okay this is a good question what's your job as a ceo Okay uh just do anything which no one else wants to do right put put quite simply that's how i describe it in one sentence so let's think about what does someone else not want to do well no one wants to resolve conflicts between two people because we anyways run away from conflict it's very normal human thing to do the other thing is not many people enjoy the process of writing things down communicating with each other and writing codifying stuff that's again something you pick up as ceo finally whether you like it or not not too many people enjoy the process of hiring because they have to turn around and tell people no i'm not giving you the job or no i am not taking your application to the next step unless your startup has a professional recruiter you are actually going to do recruitment and in any case even with a professional recruiter i'd say Uh, be part of the first hundred people you're hiring, right? Because they play a huge impact on your company. So those are three things, right? TLDR is, dude, you're doing everything which no one else wants to do. 
that does not include cleaning the floors because you're probably running a remote company just to make that clear yeah um uh, rahul how much time do you have i i can go on for like another 5 10 minutes that's oh, fine oh awesome cool yeah yeah, yeah. um someone's asking did you have a conflict between choosing between number of users and revenue oh yeah it's 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 always uh, it's always like that right and ultimately that goes down to something called a north star metric which is what are you really tracking and more importantly depending on what kind of company you are if you're venture back does that north star metric align with what your investors are also tracking about you as a company because most investors would put money not just in one round but in multiple rounds of financing uh is there a conflict between number of users and revenue for us not really because even though revenue may be a north star metric we also track something called average revenue per user to make sure that we don't just chase very very large revenue pools from a single individual so just think about how you balance that got it um another simple one three things you look for before hiring someone who do like this really varies by what i'm hiring the person for but general skills common are, yeah method. just general skills i would look for from someone is number one is are you comfortable reading and writing stuff because as a remote company a lot of communication is done asynchronously so are you like crystal clear in terms of when you write something down what you mean or when you speak something you really know what it means so that communication thing especially for remote company a uh, second thing i tend to look for is we have a way to test you for how fast you learn i won't share how we do that because a lot of companies have their ways to do it the reason why it's important for us is most people coming to join us know jack shit about insurance they need to learn really fast because unless you unless you don't unless you're not a subject matter expert at what sort of domain your company is operating in or within the vertical of the domain your company is operating in you can't design well you can't engineer well you can't manage a product because you don't understand the product so for us that's super important right how fast do we think you can learn and then finally like honestly do you seem like a friendly person because we do a team at least like some of the coworkers who will work with you come on a call at the end of the final interview just to gauge how you would operate in like a team setting because dude like if people don't get along with you you don't get along with people it's going to tank very yeah. quickly i think yeah. that's also the most important part like more than skill um yeah. checking if they vibe with you and if they're a yeah. fast learner yeah look there there are only very specific roles in a company where you really need to hire for skill right which is your senior executives your devops engineers your cyber sec engineers those are places where you can't uh, you know compromise on skill i think everywhere else it's fine as long as you feel the person will grow fast with the company like i still remember last year when we were like just building the website i just put out an instagram story saying you know can someone help me build this website so one dude texted me he said i i'm learning html can i help you out and uh, he's darshil rathor he's leading like front end right now and right now he knows more react than like any bit student like he's one of the best front end engineers we have so it's crazy how you know we sort of vibe together and he learned as we grew as a company and you know things like yeah. that um okay final question why do you write on linkedin oh that's that's a pretty good question so there are two reasons for it the first is aids become such a habit for me so before all of you started hitting the like button i've been writing on linkedin for 4 years I'm very sorry if you were not on LinkedIn then but yeah I've been writing for about 4 years what I like about writing on LinkedIn every day is and and I do it only if I feel there's a topic worth writing about right but it just turns out when you're running a company there are a shit ton of things you are thinking about and can therefore write about what it gives me is like an opportunity for literally 15 minutes a day to say i am not going to be myself i'm going to think about what i do and write something there it is super helpful for me because i have actually thought through stuff which we're doing wrong stuff which we're doing right and putting it in writing really allows me to go back and track how we're improving 
also it's a nice little break from my morning 7 to 10 am slot where i don't get my ass off the chair and just do work so i get to think about something outside of work and finally it's super helpful to finding interesting people whom you can bring in so all of our senior hires in the company have only come in because we interacted via linkedin for quite a while so it allows them to engage with you before they commit to joining you and if you are familiar with how expensive recruitment fees are it's worth every moment of time spent writing cool uh, i guess i mean this is one personal question how does your day look like okay uh i can give you like a broad outline and then specifics obviously very sure, sure, yeah the 100% thing which i do every every sort of working day which is at least monday to friday is to always get my 7 am to 10 am uninterrupted no phone no headphones no music hit the two to three most important items for me to do in a given day so tomorrow i'm actually going to sit down and go over that full 3 hour period on a very specific task with regards to something called our leads funnel but i'm going to sit down 3 hours and get that out of the way because it's very important single task or maybe two to three big tasks i think the next big block for me is maybe 1 to 2:30 on a weekday so 1 to 2 is gym 2 to 2:30 is like coming back from the gym etc for me that's quite helpful because most of our work in the company only happens after 3 pm most people are nocturnal i'd say 3 to 7 just goes into either user research where we talk to users or some team sync where there are certain op- that things which are messing around with other people and post 7 pm really varies right but what i always end up doing is somewhere between 9:30 to 11:30 i do a bit of reading and i do the reading quite religiously so that's sort of my day but i think when, when you're a found, when you're running a company or when you're a senior exec at a company you want to make sure you can split your time between what mark andreessen defines as maker time manager time manager time means you just leave open blocks in your day to allow people to come and harass you ruin your evening morning night and day which they love to do right that's why you're paid to do this and the maker stuff which i personally enjoy much more requires you to take these big chunks of time when no one interrupts you so if you want raise money and buy a house like harish and the blue learn team have and work there because no one will disturb you yeah uh cool rahul uh, thanks a lot this has been super insightful for me as well i learned a lot and um if you guys have any questions i see a lot of unanswered questions yeah. maybe you can just um tweet and tag rahul oh my god a lot of spams today i need to figure out a way of like avoiding this um maybe you guys can just drop rahul a linkedin dm or something uh hope this was useful and thanks again rahul it's always a pleasure having you bye guys um take care and see you see you soon in another session take care everyone thank you bye Whew. oh you're just seeing the chat yeah it is way too many do i don't think i'll be able to answer all of these <laughs> okay uh i can i can try answering some of these few of them are like super vague so yeah. i'd be hard okay okay well one of them is definitely about how much financial knowledge do you need to have as a founder uh just spend like half a day on a book called venture deals by brad feld you can find a pdf version online which should be good enough and trust me that's more than enough in in most cases you probably end up getting a lawyer also or a ca at some point even if you're running a bootstrap business so yeah yeah That at least for us a lawyer did most of the work he yeah. in fact taught us about a lot of terms yeah yeah. So, yeah yeah i think you probably were not familiar with uh, with convert convert sorry not convertible convert. in your case it was preference shares and everything yeah ss yeah preference shares price rounds and everything Honestly all of this primarily becomes relevant at a series A you like to mm-hmm. learn it yourself or you'll find someone in your company who'll pick this up for you i just understand it because i read the book and insurance is very similar to finance so mm. i kind of picked it up there it's good good questions awesome rahul uh, probably in the next session we can can cover these questions 